Storytime with Hannah Mary presents The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald Chapter 28 The Preacher Various reports went undulating through the city as to the nature of what had taken place in the palace. The people gathered and stared at the house, eyeing it as if it had sprung up in the night. But it looked sedate enough, remaining closed and silent, like a house that was dead. They saw no one come out or go in. Smoke rose from a chimney or two. There was hardly another sign of life. It was not for some little time generally understood that the highest officers of the crown, as well as the lowest menials of the palace, had been dismissed in disgrace. For who was to recognize a Lord Chancellor in his nightshirt? And what Lord Chancellor would, so attired in the street, proclaim his rank and office aloud? Before it was day, most of the courtiers crept down to the river, hired boats, and betook themselves to their homes or their friends in the country. It was assumed in the city that the domestics had been discharged upon a sudden discovery of general and unpardonable peculation, for, almost everybody being guilty of it himself, petty dishonesty was the crime most easily credited and least easily passed over in Gwynstorm. Now that same day was religion day and not a few of the clergy, always glad to seize on any passing event to give interest to the dull and monotonic grind of their intellectual machines, made this remarkable one the ground of discourse to their congregations. More especially than the rest, the first priest of the great temple, where was the royal pew, judged himself, from his relation to the palace, called upon to improve the occasion, for they talked ever about improvement at Gwynstorm, all the time they were going downhill with a rush. The book which had, of late years, come to be considered the most sacred, was called The Book of Nations, and consisted of proverbs and history traced through custom. From it the first priest chose his text, and his text was, Honesty is the best policy. He was considered a very eloquent man, but I can offer only a few of the larger bones of his sermon. The main proof of the verity of their religion, he said, was that things always went well with those who professed it, and its first fundamental principle, grounded in inborn invariable instinct, was that everyone should take care of that one. This was the first duty of man. If everyone would but obey this law, number one, then would everyone be perfectly cared for, one being always equal to one. But the faculty of care was in excess of need, and all that overflowed, and would otherwise run to waste, ought to be gently turned in the direction of one's neighbor, seeing that this also wrought for the fulfilling of the law, inasmuch as the reaction of excess so directed was upon the director of the same, to the comfort, that is, and well-being of the original self. To be just and friendly was to build the warmest and safest of all nests, and to be kind and loving was to line it with the softest of all furs and feathers, for the one precious, comfort-loving self there to lie, reveling in downiest bliss. One of the laws, therefore, most binding upon men, because of its relation to the first and greatest of all duties, was embodied in the proverb he had just read. And what stronger proof of its wisdom and truth could they desire than the sudden and complete vengeance which had fallen upon those worse than ordinary sinners who had offended against the king's majesty by forgetting that honesty is the best policy? At this point of the discourse, the head of the leg serpent rose from the floor of the temple, towering above the pulpit, above the priest, then curving downwards with open mouth slowly descended upon him. Horror froze the sermon pump. He stared upwards, aghast. The great teeth of the animal closed upon a mouthful of the sacred vestments, and slowly he lifted the preacher from the pulpit, like a handful of linen from a wash-tub, and, on his four solemn stumps, bore him out of the temple, dangling aloft from his jaws. At the back of it he dropped him into the dust-hole among the remnants of a library whose age had destroyed its value in the eyes of the chapter. They found him burrowing in it, a lunatic henceforth, whose madness presented the peculiar feature that in his paroxysms he jabbered sense. 
bone-freezing horror pervaded Gwynstorm. If their best and wisest were treated with such contempt, what might not the rest of them look for? Alas, for their city, their grandly respectable city, their loftily reasonable city. Where it was all to end, the convenient alone could tell. But something must be done. Hastily assembling, the priests chose a new first priest, and in full conclave unanimously declared and accepted that the king, in his retirement, had, through the practice of the blackest magic, turned the palace into a nest of demons in the midst of them. A grand exorcism was therefore indispensable. In the meantime, the fact came out that the greater part of the courtiers had been dismissed, as well as the servants, and this fact swelled the hope of the party of decency, as they called themselves. Upon it they proceeded to act, and strengthened themselves on all sides. The action of the king's bodyguard remained for a time uncertain, but when at length its officers were satisfied that both the master of the horse and their colonel were missing, they placed themselves under the orders of the first priest. Everyone dated the culmination of the evil from the visit of the miner and his mongrel, and the butchers vowed if they could but get hold of them again they would roast both of them alive. At once they formed themselves into a regiment, and put their dogs in training for attack. Incessant was the talk, innumerable were the suggestions, and great was the deliberation. The general consent, however, was that as soon as the priests should have expelled the demons, they would depose the king, and attired in all his regal insignia, shut him in a cage for public show, then choose governors, with the Lord Chancellor at their head, whose first duty should be to remit every possible tax, and the magistrates, by the mouth of the city marshal, required all able-bodied citizens, in order to do their part towards the carrying out of these, and a multitude of other reforms, to be ready to take arms at the first summons. Things needful were prepared as speedily as possible, and a mighty ceremony in the temple, in the marketplace, and in front of the palace, was performed for the expulsion of the demons. This over, the leaders retired to arrange an attack upon the palace. But that night events occurred which, proving the failure of their first, induced the abandonment of their second intent. Certain of the prowling order of the community, whose numbers had of late been steadily on the increase, reported frightful things. Demons of indescribable ugliness had been espied careering through the midnight streets and courts. A citizen, some said in the very act of housebreaking, but no one cared to look into trifles at such a crisis, had been seized from behind, he could not see by what, and soused in the river. A well-known receiver of stolen goods had had his shop broken open, and when he came down in the morning had found everything in ruin on the pavement. The wooden image of justice over the door of the city marshal had had the arm that had the sword bitten off. The gluttonous magistrate had been pulled from his bed in the dark, by beings of which he could see nothing but the flaming eyes, and treated to a bath of the turtle soup that had been left simmering by the side of the kitchen fire. Having poured it over him, they put him again into his bed, where he soon learned how a mummy must feel in its cerements. Worst of all, in the marketplace was fixed up a paper with the king's own signature, to the effect that whoever henceforth should show inhospitality to strangers, and should be convicted of the same, should be instantly expelled the city, while a second, in the butcher's quarter, ordained that any dog which henceforward should attack a stranger should be immediately destroyed. It was plain, said the butchers, that the clergy were of no use. They could not exorcise demons. That afternoon, catching sight of a poor old fellow in rags and tatters, quietly walking up the street, they hounded their dogs upon him, and had it not been that the door of Durba's cottage was standing open, and was near enough for him to dart in and shut it ere they reached him, he would have been torn in pieces. And thus things went on for some days. End of chapter 28 Find more stories on Instagram at storytime.with.hannamary.com